You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. And now, here are your hosts, Sarah and Esteban. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah, and this is episode 182. Today's podcast is brought to you by Elite Science. Unlock your dog's full potential with a unique competitive edge solution, 1TDC. One Tetradecanol Complex is a patented blend of unique fatty acid oils designed to safely and effectively keep joints and muscles at their best to maximize performance and shorten recovery time. One TDC is the next generation of fatty acids and is used by many current and past National Agility Champions and World Team members. All of our listeners will automatically qualify for a great One TDC special offer by purchasing online at BDA1 tdc.com. That's B-D-A, the number one, tdc.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by hittedboard.com. Hittedboard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with the dog walker A-frame? The hittedboard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love to tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to hittedboard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hittedboard.com. Today, we're going to talk about how you can choose your own agility adventure. Do you remember those books, Choose Your Own Adventure books? I used to love them when I was in elementary school. So did I. I loved those books. They were a little bit freaky, though, because like things would happen to you, like you'd Sometimes bad eaten things by a would monster. Happen, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So hopefully, in our version, nothing bad happens. But the idea of these books was you th- there was no single story. You started reading this book, you got to a decision point, and you chose your own adventure. You you choose to do this or you choose to do that. And then it would tell you what page to go to, and you would continue on your story, and you could kind of create this whole unique experience for you. It's a really interesting concept because in some ways reading is passive. It's something that you participate in, but something that is dictated to you. And I think when a lot of people get into agility, it's very much like that. You're a novice, you're a beginner, you don't know much about the sport, and there's kind of a path to take. There are a lot of assumptions that you're going to discover and learn about, maybe not even directly, but by watching and listening to other people talk about agility. So what we wanted to talk about today is how you can kind of throw that out the window and choose your own path in agility and choose the right path for you and your dog. And so it kind of starts with, it kind of goes hands in hands with goals, right? Setting your own goals. What are your goals in the sport? Is your goal in the sport to get titles? Is your goal in the sport to win, which those are very different things. Mm -hmm. Um, Is your goal in the sport to win at a national level? Is your goal in the sport to compete at an international level? There are lots of goals that we can have and they're not, they don't have value in and of themselves. Everybody's goals can be different and valuable to them. The important thing there, I think about goals are that they are created and driven by you. Now, they can be influenced by many different external factors, and let's talk about a couple of them. They're all the same things that, uh, not things, the same people, sometimes things, that uh, normally guide your choices, the choices that you make in dog training and dog agility specifically. So that would be your friends, your friends in sport, sometimes your friends outside of the sport. There are family considerations to make. Many people out there have spouses or children and they are not invested in dog agility the same way that you are. And so that might influence your goals. Maybe you can't travel as much as you would like to in order to accomplish uh, certain goals. Maybe you can't travel abroad, for example. Maybe you can't go to nationals when you live on the West Coast, and it's all the way over on the East Coast because work has some kind of impact on the goals that you select for yourself. Um, I think the different organizations actually have a subtle influence on, sometimes not so subtle influence on your goals. I was just about to jump in and say, it's really not subtle at all. In fact, it's usually the driving force behind most people. And that's where I think a lot of people don't even question the goals of, let's say, getting titles. 
It, it is laid out in front of you. There is a tidal progression, and that's great for a lot of people. But what I want people to realize is you don't even have to buy in to an organization's title progression. You could make up your own internal titles. Um, you know, we, we were talking about the uh, grand champion title, the new AKC title, which I think is fantastic. And I love seeing the premier classes being brought into that title. But I could also envision somebody who creates their own version of a grand champion where they want to be a mock that's AKC's champion title, an ATCH, the USDA champion's title, and a UKI champion. And that is the goal they set themselves. They, they say, I want to be a champion in three different organizations, and that's going to be my driving motivator. So uh, these title progressions don't have to dictate how we show either. Mm-hmm. I think that's very true. It's interesting that you talk about title progressions, because when I first came into the sport and I started with a golden retriever, many, many years ago, almost 20 years ago now, that's definitely the first thing that was on my mind. How quickly can we earn the novice title? I wanted to be the first one in the litter to earn my novice title, not necessarily to be the fastest or quote unquote best uh, dog in that litter. I want to be the first one to get the title. Uh, Then it was a big deal. The first one to get the mock, right? The master agility championship title Uh, then. So over the years, my goals have shifted. I'm a little more uh, performance based in terms of uh, speed rather than titles. I think the sport has evolved in a way that both of those goals are possible, but often not together. Sometimes you're going to have to sacrifice one for the other, but there are the rare handler dog teams that can make it. So, for example, we have the AKC Invitational which is based largely on points and in certain uh, high volume breeds, border collies, golden retrievers, shelties, it's going to take a lot of points to finish in the top five to earn an invitation to that event. Whereas if you have a very, very rare breed, uh, say a Bolsarone, you know, you may only need a couple of clean runs in order to finish in the top five and earn an invitation because there just aren't that many competing in AKC agility. And so people might look at those dogs, say, let's say you have a very fast Sheltie, but you cannot possibly travel or show enough to get all the points to go to the Invitational. Well, something that people might be tempted to do is say, well, oh, those are only for the very consistent dogs who show every really weekend. Invitational doesn't really matter. And, and on top of that, they will, uh, yeah, belittle it a little bit. But even getting away from their opinion of it, they will look at it and say, well, that's not something that I can do. So that's not an event for me, but maybe something like AKC Nationals is where the qualifications will let in many, many more than just five Shelties. If you have a Sheltie, it's very reasonable for you to go to Nationals and then you can make making the finals a goal. And that's how the organization, I think, in how they design their events which events they give, which events they showcase, right, uh, can have a powerful influence on your goals. And But we'll talk a little bit about how people belittle the goals of other people, but I want to kind of save that for a little bit later in yeah, the podcast. Yeah, that'll be kind of wrap-up time. But I wanted to bring it back to what you were talking about with your initial goals with your Golden Retriever. And, you know, yes, looking back, you know, it was a little – naive, maybe even a little silly to to say that your one and only goal was to be the first to get that novice title. But I also want to step back and say, that's a perfectly valid goal at that time. And what did you do? You went out and you got private lessons, you know, Mm -hmm. multiple times a week. And you got out there, you trained her, you got her debuted, she was had a perfect opening weekend. So it moved you forward. It's not the same goal you would have 15 years later, given, you know, how we compete now, but it was a perfectly valid goal at the time. And you chose an adventure for you and her at that time. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. What we're talking about here is a, an artificial construct, right? It's completely made up. It's made up by people. It's made up by your competitors, your instructors, the organization, what you think popular opinion is, what you see on social media, what you're reading in magazines like Clean Run, what you're seeing on people's blogs about dog agility. 
And the construct for a long time has always been that over the lifetime of any one dog, or for someone it may happen over the lifetime of several dogs, what's going to happen is you're going to start in agility as a novice and you're going to be really bad. Then you're going to get better. And then you're going to be able to earn a championship title in whatever organization you compete in, but your dog's not necessarily going to be the fastest. After you get that goal, now you're going to suddenly be interested in national level competition, being a contender or a finalist if you want to be. And then, of course, the pinnacle of all of that would be running, at least here in the United States, on an international team. And so in this structure that starts with novice and ends with international handling and an international team as the highest form of agility, there's this unspoken assumption or implication that if you don't keep progressing, that if you don't move up that pyramid to the top, then at some point you've stalled out. Well, and it's like it's like a straight line. It's like a road with no branches. It just goes in one direction. There's only one way to go. And if you aren't going that way, you're going nowhere. Right. And, and what we want to do is say, let's think of it like a tree, you know, sure. that, where there's this multiple is what, This paths. is what we're railing against. We don't think this should be the model. I don't think that international handling or competitions are the pinnacle of agility or anyone's agility career. It shouldn't be the track that you're necessarily on. A lot of people come into the sport, they see this pyramid, they look at the top and they say, well, I can't get there. And they immediately feel what? They feel disenfranchised, disenfranchised, (laughs) disheartened, you know, like, oh, I've lost before I've begun. Right. That's right. So we want you to Come up with your own notions. And we wanted to give you some ideas like, you know, making up your own internal titles, some ideas of things that you might not have thought about that would help you to choose your own adventure. I think the obvious ones are, well, you know, invitational is a great goal for some dogs, not a great goal for other dogs. Okay. A lot of people have thought about that. Um, nationals. Some dogs, that's going to be a great goal. Some dogs, it's not what they're interested in. A lot of people have thought about that. I think Westminster is also a big new one. Because even when it first came out, people are like, well, why is Westminster getting all this press? The dogs in it aren't very good. This is from people who are pretty good at agility, right? National level type competitors. And um, I think you're seeing the the quality and level of handling kind of improve steadily each year. And Westminster, it becomes more of a big deal, but that's where all the television coverage is right now, the media coverage. And it makes sense, I think, for people to say, well, this is a goal for me. This is something that I'd like to do. Right. You may be one of those once in a career kind of events that you go to or every year. Uh, and I think that is a great new one. Part of the idea for this podcast came from a question when we were um, posting the live stream to the U.S. European Open tryouts that just recently happened. And somebody mentioned, you know, I would love to run those courses, but I don't think I'm ever going to do European Open or, you know, that travel's not for me or, you know, something along those lines. And I thought, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't go to the trout event with the idea that the event is the end point. Everybody's going to tryouts thinking tryouts is just a stepping stone to the team. That's the only reason I'm going. But it's an event where you get to compete against some of the best dogs in the country on actual FCI international courses. And if you've been training those With the skills, judges who are going to judge those actual events, one that's of the right. judges will be. And so if you wanted to, you could say, I I can't afford to actually go to EO. I can't take the time off work. I don't travel well. I'm not going to put my large dog on a plane uh, overseas. But you could still go to the event and just say, for me, this event is it. I am here to do my best at this event to put my dog up against the best dogs in the country and see how we do. And that was kind of my advice. And then later I thought, you know, that's really true. Like, I could do that. I could make that choice for myself. And there may be some events that I'm not going to now because I'm not interested. You know, maybe I don't go to a regional, uh, a USDA regional because I know I'm not going to go to the actual sign of sports because of where it is in the country or something like that, right? But if there's a regional nearby, 
I could still go and make that the end point for my adventure to say, I want to go to this regional where the co- competition is going to be a little bit harder than what I'm used to. The courses are going to be a little bit more interesting. And I'm going to make that the end point. I had two dogs that I made uh, world team tryouts the end point. One was Sammy the Rottweiler. She had a really good year later in life, somewhere around 2008. And I took her to tryouts knowing that she wasn't going to be the fastest dog, although I was surprised by how many dogs she was faster than. And knowing that we didn't have the handling skills at all for those kind of courses. And um, just to have that experience, I felt that it was something that she had earned and it was nice to go out there and uh, see her run. And then the other dog we had was a very small border collie named Rook. She's still with us. She's now 15. 15 right. And uh, mostly blind, completely deaf. But um, Rook won the international classes, first place in standard, first place jumpers at one of the big cluster events. Here in Houston. Here in Houston. And so without needing to get any other legs or qualifications, she'd earned the opportunity to go to the world team tryouts. So again, a dog who's smallish, uh, we didn't really have the skills. And um, I'm not coming into that event thinking that there's a legitimate chance to make the team. Uh, but I felt like, again, it was something, it was a right that she had earned, right? And I made that like her endpoint, the highlight of um, her year. And so I did that for uh, both of those dogs. I think another example for all of this, an explicit example, is the difference between Gitchy and her littermate Red. Red is her brother, outstanding golden retriever run by Amanda Smelser. And Red is the one who earned the Agility Grand Champion title, one of the first dogs to do it. Uh, I believe one of the, uh, the first golden retriever. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's right. And you've got to get legs and fast and time to beat and uh, premiere, right? These international style courses. You know, so there's a lot of people out there getting their master agility championship, their mock, but aren't willing to step into the premier arena. But Amanda did. And she made that a goal for them. And they went out and they did it. It's a really big deal. But with Gitchy, I chose a different path because... Even though Gitchy had run with Susan a little bit and gotten a couple of time to beat in fast legs, I never ran a single fast or time to beat course with Gitchy. All I did was premiere. I only did premiere to get her ready for international competition and the national level stuff. And that's all I did. Like I didn't, it was not a goal of mine to get the agility grand champion title. It was, however, a goal of mine to do as best as we could at these um, qualifying events. And I think she did very, very well. Uh, and so you have two litter mates, right? Two different handlers two different branches on that tree that you're talking about. You know, the the choose your own adventure tree. And so I think that's a really great way to look at it because now, I mean, if you think now's the time to talk about it, what what achievement is higher? Which of us is better? Who's better? Me or Amanda? Who's the better dog? Red or Gitchy? Right? That's that's a trick question. Right? These are all artificial constructs that people have given our sport. We've each chosen different adventures. Let me give you one other idea. And I actually didn't think about this until just now as being a choose your own adventure idea. But uh, when my dog got to masters in jumpers, but was not yet masters in standard. So when I run masters jumpers, I can get points. I can work towards my my uh, MXJ, but I cannot get double Qs because I'm not in Masters and Standard, right? And for me, double Qs are always the thing that I need for for any event, right? If I'm if I'm trying to go to nationals or whatever, double Qs are what's going to hold me back, not points, just because of the speed of my dog. So every Masters jumpers run is only worth points. So what I decided to do was not enter Masters jumpers. And I enter premier jumpers instead because, because I have my AXJ title, I'm eligible to do premier jumpers. So I will enter premier jumpers, regular standard, premier jumpers, regular standard, uh, because I'm just not concerned with earning points or earning uh, MXJ legs, Mm -hmm. right? And so that was my own adventure and my plan going forward would be to get the double cues that I need for nationals and then to just enter premiere. 
And, you know, we have time constraints, we have kids. So, you know, I would rather show up and run premiere and go home earlier or go later and then have, you know, more of the day with the family. I don't feel like I need to always do master's standard master's jumper. So that's kind of my own take on the adventure. And I think now um, that we're further along this podcast, I realize that we don't have to limit this to just trialing. I think a lot of this can apply to training. For example, do you know of anyone who's trying to do a running contact, but they're not really at the kind of level where they could go and be on the world team and win an agility world championship? You know, there's a lot of people like that. And so then someone might say, well, why are you doing that? You know, there's a lot of reasons that someone might be doing that. And again, I think of it as another branch on the uh, the agility tree. It could it's be a, the challenge of it. The skill it could of be it. the excitement yeah. of it. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's absolutely something where you can take a, a slower dog or a medium speed dog or a good dog who's not elite speeded and um, really speed them up with that running contact. But just the experience of training it. Uh, I think another good example is the um, divide, which really isn't a divide anymore between people who prefer to train online versus training exclusively in person. You know, some people need the hands-on, some people do very well with both, but there's no right or wrong here. That's right. And then the other thing that I have thought a lot about as its own topic, but it fits in so well here, is the idea that there is so much agility out there today. There are more organizations, there are more international teams, there are more international events, there are more premier national events. And so there's so many options for people to branch out and make their own adventure. But the other thing that I want to point out is there are so many options you need to make your own adventure. Mm-hmm. It's Too not many, possible it's, anymore to look at a pyramid and say, I am going to start here and eventually get to the top. Exactly. And there are a lot of people that feel left out. They feel left out because they don't have the time to go to the invitational. Rather than feeling left out, you need to find your adventure. You need to go down your own path because there's nobody that is going to do every organization's nationals, all of the team tryouts, all of the regionals, like those people don't exist. The people who are spending the time to go to the invitational are doing it instead of taking some other path. And so I don't want people to feel left out because they can't do everything, because nobody can do everything. Mm -hmm. It is there to give opportunities for all kinds of people, all kinds of goals, all kinds of dogs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we're kind of blessed to have here in the U.S., the tremendous diversity in organizations and titling programs and championship events, and even having multiple international events overseas. You know, uh, sometimes you see handlers be frustrated with that because they want to do everything, but they can't do everything. Well, you know, that's part of the life choices that you have to make. You have you to be okay with that. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to be, for example, um, I don't, I can't even think of really good uh, examples, but if you're going to be, say, you know, a nuclear physicist, you know, that's probably going to exclude the possibility of you being a professional psychiatrist. I was you know, going to say basketball gotta, star. Or, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or that's right. Or to play in the NBA, you know, it would be very difficult for you to turn around and also be a world class swimmer. You know, you kind of got to, you're going to make those choices and take those branches. And, you know, it's just like the choose your own adventure book. You go down this route and suddenly you're being eaten by a bear. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so, you know, it it um it happens. You can't do everything all at once, although I certainly appreciate the sentiment, uh, but it's certainly not a right that we have to be able to go out and earn every possible thing. Right. And I think that not only is it not a right, but I think it can lead to a lot of dissatisfaction. A lot of unhappiness. When you expect to be able to do it all. And so that's why I think it's kind of a a freeing thing, a freeing idea for everybody to listen and to give themselves permission to not do everything, to give themselves permission to choose the path that's right for them and their dog and to be happy with that. And I think that this is a great segue into, you know, some of the negativity that can come in. And I think a lot of it comes from two things. I think it comes from people who have a very fixed idea of what the progression should be. And they, and they haven't really, they haven't really accepted this idea of choose your own adventure. And I think it comes from people who 
are upset with their own circumstances that they can't do X, Y, Z, and therefore they want to take away the value of doing that thing. So I think invitationals is a great example of something where some people cannot do it because they cannot afford to show that much or take that much time or or don't want to because of the wear and tear on their dog. And so perceived they perceived wear and tear on the dog. Perceived wear and tear on the dog, says the the uh, medical professional who likes to see studies. But but then they take that and they belittle the people who do go. They try to take away from that achievement because it's an achievement that they can't have. And that's where I think that we all need to take a step back and respect each other's adventures and. Everybody, and then on the, on the flip side of that is you need to protect your own adventure. If there are negative people who don't appreciate the path that you're on, ignore them. You know, if you're one of those people who's teaching running contacts to your novice A dog, you've never competed in agility and somebody rolls their eye at you, just forget about it. Like, don't let it get to you. But then if you're one of those people doing the eye rolling, maybe rethink where that um, annoyance is coming from. Yeah, and everybody does this. Everyone has done it at some point or another. It happens. It's okay. Sometimes we all make mistakes, but you don't want to limit others. You know, if everybody's on some kind of journey in agility, taking this path, this road, and they come to a bridge, Are you going to help that person across the bridge? Are you going to be a guide on this person's journey? Or are you going to be a troll? The troll that lives under the agility bridge. Don't be the troll that lives under the agility bridge. Yeah, that's where that comes from. Internet trolls, right? And I think too often you see that in social media. And I'm disappointed to see so much of it in dog agility. And so don't limit others. Be the guide. Don't be the troll. Get out there. And choose your own adventure as well. I think you'll find it very uh, fulfilling. And hopefully you find this podcast very freeing. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Elite Science, Hitaboard.com, and also NTI Global. It's NTI Agility's biggest sale of the year. All items, all colors, and all variations are made to order and on sale. These are the savings you've been waiting for. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com for the widest selection of dog agility tunnels for both competition and backyard training. Known for free shipping, more options, high quality products, and low prices, NTI Global has got you covered. They also offer tamer and anchor weight bags along with a full line of accessories and agility storage solutions. Need your agility gear in a hurry? Don't forget to check the in-stock selection. Visit at shop.ntiglobal.com today. Happy training! The past, the present, and the future walk into a bar. It was tense.